Did I mention that I was an atheist? Atheism is a disbelief or lack of belief in the existence of God or gods. It can also be known as non-belief, disbelief, unbelief, irreligion, skepticism, doubt, agnosticism, nihilism. There's no sacred book in atheism, no central organization or authority, so it is rather relative. Atheism can be determined to be that which you want it to be. So nailing down which description of atheism to use can be difficult. One who believes and or knows there is no God, lacks belief in a God, exercises no faith in the concept of God, one who is free from religious oppression and bigotry, one who is a free thinker, free from religion and its ideas. Most atheists do not consider themselves anti-theists, but simply non-theists. Atheism denies God. Man is the measure of all things, the determiner of things, the God of all things. I understand that most of you atheists out there live perfectly normal lives, but I can never understand why you would want to. Think about it. We've got this massive universe, and over here is a tiny little crumb of a galaxy. I don't want to the spiral arms of this galaxy is a thoroughly unremarkable ball of hot gas. Circling this ball of hot gas is a pathetic speck of cosmic dust we call Earth, and crawling all over the Earth are these feeble, selfish, self-destructive lumps of cells constantly deluding themselves into thinking that what they do is so important. But the universe couldn't conceivably care less whether you love your neighbor as yourself or torture them to death for fun. So you might as well do whatever you feel like doing with the little bit of time you've got. The thief and the murderer follow nature just as much as the philanthropist. Cosmic evolution may teach us how the good and the evil tendencies of man may have come about, but in itself it is incompetent to furnish any better reason why what we call good is preferable to what we call evil than we had before. And what are my atheist friends going to do with your 80 years or so? Let me guess, you're going to go to school for a while, then get a job, work for a few decades, maybe pick up a family along the way, then retire and die of old age or some illness. How original. Free thinkers, huh? Believe it or not, some people don't want to live like cattle. Some people don't want to follow this pattern that we're all expected to mindlessly follow. Some would rather bash a man's head in, or shoot up a theater, or walk down their school hallway, uh, stabbing people. And, and why shouldn't they? Because it's wrong? Says who, your grandma? Or should they try not to hurt people because people have intrinsic value? Here I thought that human beings are nothing but machines for propagating DNA. Most people don't want to kill and slaughter, but for those who do, our civilization is rapidly destroying any significant reason they might have for resisting the urge to kill and slaughter. Young people are lining up to dance to the music of their DNA. All you can do now is hope that they get tackled when they stop to reload or that they make some huge blunder when their bloodbath begins. I made a huge blunder when my bloodbath began. I underestimated the amount of damage a human head could endure. Crushed skulls can apparently be pieced back together by doctors. My dad had brain damage, but he survived the attack. I was taken to a mental hospital and later to jail. Jail is a place to sit back and reflect on the things you've done. You've got plenty of time to sit back and think, why did I get caught? What steps can I take to avoid getting caught next time? And without all of the empty, repetitive tasks that ordinarily keep you mentally sedated, you've got plenty of time to, to figure out what's most important to you. The most important thing to me was not being a slave to people for whom I had nothing but contempt. But people had controlled me in various ways throughout my life, and this meant that they would need to be taught a lesson. I had a list of people going back to kindergarten who were going to be brutally murdered. But doubts occasionally crept in. I would ask myself, is there a point to any of this? 
nothing really matters, so what difference does it make whether I do everything I've been planning or I do nothing at all? There's no blue ribbon for making the right decision here because there is no right. But when I would start to think that life off the leash was just as meaningless as life on the leash, I'd start to lose my mind. It, I was able to hold things together to some extent, mentally, because I had something to do. But if what I had to do was pointless, then holding things together was pointless. So I was at an edge, and there's nowhere to go but over it. If we present man with a concept of man which is not true, we may well corrupt him when we present him as an automation of reflexes, as a mind machine, as a bundle of instincts, as a pawn of drives and reactions, as a mere product of heredity and environment. Then we feed the nihilism to which modern man is in any case prone. I became acquainted with the last stage of corruption in the human heart in my second concentration camp in Auschwitz. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and environment, or as the Nazis liked to say, of blood and soil. I am absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Majdanek were ultimately prepared, listen now, please listen, were ultimately prepared not in some ministry of defense or some such portfolio or other in Berlin, but rather at the desks and lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. <laughs> hmm. Hello, Dr. Pomeranke. I heard your lecture tonight at the college on criminal biology. DNA, instinct, and aggression. It's a well thought out presentation, but a bit abstract. Too academic, if you ask me. Hmm. What I want to know is, have you ever really lived out your theory? It was in vain. They are materialists. For them nothing besides matter exists, and to them a man is like wood, like an eggshell. With this belief they sink to unthinkable depths of cruelty. The cruelty of atheism is hard to believe. When a man has no faith in the reward of good or the punishment of evil, there is no reason to be human. There is no restraint from the depths of evil that is in man. The communist torturers often said, there is no God, no hereafter, no punishment for evil. We can do what we wish. I heard one torturer say, I thank God, in whom I don't believe, and that I have lived to this hour, when I can express all the evil in my heart. He expressed it in unbelievable brutality and torture inflicted on prisoners. Now when the worst came, and I don't wish to tell you words, because I know you have much communist propaganda in America, and some don't believe words, I'll show you, not my body, I don't boast with my sufferings, I will show you the tortured body of my fatherland and of the underground church behind the Iron Curtain, just look here. 
I am an unworthy and an insignificant sinner, and I don't dare to compare myself. But as Jesus showed to unbelieving Thomas the wounds, so I show you, so communist torture Christians, look here. Look here. Look here to the back, and I can't show you, the whole body is like this. So communists torture those who believe in Christ, who believe in God. Christians are happy to suffer like this, but it is your duty to fight to stop these sufferings and to sustain with your love the brethren who suffer behind the iron curtain for the faith which you yourself have. With red hot iron pokers, with rubber truncheons, with sticks, with all kinds of methods, Christians were tortured by the communists. Or are you content writing your papers inside your ivory tower, torturing your captive audience of students with your intellectual posturing? What do you want from me? I'm here to test your hypothesis. You're a sociobiologist, are you not? Yes. Well, in your lecture, you argued for the genetic origins of crime. Biology determines behavior. Well, I'd like to debate you on that. What do you mean, debate? You know, dialectic. I make a proposition, you counter, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Only in this debate, the stakes are real. If you win, I let you go. If I win, that's part of the proposition. What proposition? The issue resolved. There is no valid reason why I should not kill you. Debating for the negative, <laughs> Professor Pomeroy. <laughs> and for the affirmative, yours truly. You aren't going to kill me. No. <laughs> I'll do anything, anything you say. Stimulus response. Please don't kill me. Give me one good reason. Okay. It's, it's illegal. Murder is illegal. You'll go to jail. I don't plan on being caught. But it's wrong to kill. <laughs> Professor, don't go getting all moral on me. You said that our DNA determines our behavior. DNA has no morality. It's abnormal. Your DNA is abnormal. Abnormality has to do with statistical averages, Professor. Not right or wrong. But society agrees killing is wrong. Society is another word for statistical average. We're not all from the same gene pool, you know. <laughs> but does it make it right? And it doesn't make it wrong. Our species won't survive if we allow killing. You mean you won't survive? I will. <laughs> Me and my DNA. <laughs> You're a sick man. Your mind is diseased. Correction. <laughs> <laughs> A genetically determined man with a, with a biological predisposition toward aggression. Killing is in my genes, all according to your theory. Which brings us back to the central question. No, please. If all that I am is genetically determined, why should I not in fact kill you when I am scientifically bound by my DNA to do so? Please, please have mercy. Take pity, I beg you. There's no mercy or pity in these genes. No, no, please. 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 I'm a predator. I'm nature. 
No, 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 please, I beg you, please. Beggars can't be choosers, Professor. No survival rate. And I think it's time you learn your lesson. Ideas, you see, have consequences. greatest theoretical physicist since Einstein, and I'm talking to you about Stephen Hawking. His book, A Brief History of Time, has stopped the charts for years and has been in the bestseller list in Great Britain longer than any other book up to this point, where he gives his entire scientific and philosophical view of how this world came into being and why we are here. Stephen Hawking, as many of you know, is a victim of Lou Gehrig's disease. He cannot even speak. He has no voice. Twenty years ago, the doctor told him he would not be living too long, but he has defied all odds. He holds the Lucasian chair for mathematics at Cambridge University, once upon a time held by Sir Isaac Newton. This man is a genius in every scientific sense of the term, one of his secretaries testified that on a single occasion, she dictated to him 46 pages of notes of equations back to back without a single piece of paper in front of him. And then halfway through, he backed up and went back about 20 pages, recognizing he'd made one mistake along the way. He has no voice. How does he speak? courtesy of one of California's prestigious institutions, they have designed for him a computer because the only movement capacity he has is an index finger that moves about one millimeter. And by the moving of that index finger to one millimeter, he is able to trigger a mechanism that brings before him a series of words, make his word selection, build it into a sentence, and then through a speech synthesizer, his voice comes through the microphone system there that you can hear all by the movement of one index finger for one millimeter. And I phoned his office afterwards and I said to his secretary, what happens if that movement goes to? And she says, we have a backup system where an infrared ray is beamed into his eye, and by the blinking of that eyelid, he can keep that mechanism going. I mention all this to you to tell you that there was something ironic about his subject. He was going to be dealing with the question, is man determined? Is there a design? Is there some pattern that reflects a designer or some kind of a design even in the naturalistic sense? Is man determined and designed or is he free in a sense uh, somehow through a different series of processes? And as we waited, it was a packed audience. You could get in there by invitation only. Press reporters waiting to listen to this great talk. And I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, when he was finished, there was a stunned silence in that room, almost wondering, is this all there is to it? Because he said this, yes, we have been designed, but since we do not know what the design is, we may as well not be. And then he said this, my only fear for mankind is this. He said, the terror that stalks my mind is that we have arrived on the scene because of evolution, because of naturalistic selection. And natural selection assumes natural rejection, which means we have arrived here because of our aggression. And my hope is that somehow we can keep from eating each other up for another 100 years, because then by at that point, science would have devised a scheme to take all of us into the different planets of the universe, and no one atrocity would destroy all of us at the same time. Did you hear that? The most brilliant scientist of our time. We are determined, but since we do not know what it is, we may as well not be. And his only hope is that we keep from eating each other up for another 100 years, because by that point, we'll be scattered to other planets, and no one atrocity or a tragedy will devour all of us at the same time. If you think that is some kind of an erratic idea, 
Listen to Stephen Jay Gould, one of the leading paleontologists of our day, what his answer is to origins and design. And I quote, We are here because one odd group of fishes had a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures because comets struck the earth and wiped out dinosaurs, thereby giving mammals a chance not otherwise available. So thank your lucky stars in a literal sense because the earth never froze entirely during an ice age because a small and tenuous species arising in Africa a quarter of a million years ago has managed so far to survive by hook and by crook. We may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. This explanation, though superficially troubling, if not terrifying, is ultimately liberating and exhilarating. We cannot read the meaning of life passively into the facts of nature. We must construct these answers ourselves from our wisdom and our ethical sense. There is no other way. End of quote. I couldn't help but think of Malcolm Muggeridge's rather acerbic comment about progress. He says, we have educated ourselves into imbecility. <laughs> because while morally there is nothing so vulgar left for which we cannot fly in some professor from somewhere to justify it, it looks like even academically there is no view so bizarre anymore for which we cannot fly in some professor from somewhere to justify it. I couldn't help but think of G.K. Chesterton who said it was after he read The Atheist that it led him to Jesus Christ. What a slanted, extraordinary view. We must make our meaning. We must make our purpose. The canker in the heart of paganism. I want you to hear me now. The canker in the heart of paganism was the absence of certainty that life has any meaning or ultimate value. And that canker has grown a thousand times larger in the heart of secularism. Turn with me for a different answer and let us look at what the Bible has to say about the purpose and the meaning for which we are created. Psalm chapter 8, please. Psalm chapter 8. I would like to read for you a few verses from there and then a couple of verses from the book of Romans. The 8th chapter of the book of Psalms, as David utters these words, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then in Romans chapter 8, we read this. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And then in Ephesians chapter 1, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight to the praise of his glorious grace with the purpose of his will in order that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Here is explicitly and implicitly stated how God fashioned us and what the purpose was. Please notice how it is translated here. In the New International Version, we are, the words are given to us, you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. The word is really Elohim out there and may legitimately be translated a little lower than God. And many commentators say it is appropriate to even say this with only a little bit of God lacking in him. And then when we move on to Romans 8 and Ephesians, we see a picture that is so filling and refreshing to our minds. It says this, that he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son for the praise of his glory, which moves me to the approach that I have taken tonight. 
You see, ladies and gentlemen, it is important to follow this argument here too. Everything that we create is different from us. Everything that we create is different from us. Even if an artist were to paint a magnificent self-portrait, there is something different in that portrait to himself. If a sculptor were to carve out a beautiful piece of uh, sculpture there that reflects his own image, it is still different from him. We always create something different from us. Only that which we beget is identical to us. And so we are God's creation, different from him. Jesus Christ, the only begotten of the Father, is identical to him. And when the Holy Spirit of God begets within us and brings to birth that new birth, it moves us along in the process to be conformed to the image of his Son because of the new creation and the begottenness that has taken place in us. So the creation is different. The begetting bears more similarity. And as the work of the Holy Spirit is begun, we see that. But I found renewed purpose in my lonely cell with a library at my disposal and nothing else to do. I had a perfect opportunity to prepare for an epic showdown with Randy. I could study the Bible, put together new arguments, go back to E-Block, and destroy the faith of my friend. I asked the chaplain for some Bible studies. He gave me a series of studies on the Gospel of John with graded assignments. So here I am, a rapidly deteriorating atheist, sitting in a poorly lit cell, doing my Bible homework, getting straight A's. I haven't eaten in days, and I read about Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. I'm obsessed with liberating myself from a society that has me trapped in a six and a half by eight foot cell. And I read, the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. I'm wondering how long my body can take what I'm doing to it before my heart stops. And I read, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Kind of creepy when a book talks to you, but what do I know? I used to think that cats were talking to me. Lying on my back, day after day, reflecting on life and theology and philosophy, three things started to destabilize my entire belief system. First, what's called the design argument finally hit me. I was looking at a wall and how the bricks were arranged, and I thought to myself, you know, if someone told me that these bricks went into this order by some process that didn't involve intelligence, I'd smack them in the mouth. And yet I believe that life formed without intelligence when the most basic living cell is unimaginably more complicated than some bricks stacked on a wall. Why did I blindly accept the extraordinary claim that life arose spontaneously from non-life without demanding some very good evidence. Second, I found out how Jesus' apostles died. Most of them went to their bloody desk claiming that they had seen him risen from the dead. My explanation for the origin of Christianity had always been that the apostles made up a story so that they could spread his message. But now my explanation wasn't making sense. If you're willing to die for something, you have to believe it. When a terrorist blows himself up, he's obviously sincere. So the disciples, the apostles, had to believe what they were dying for, but this means that they were, they were convinced that they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. Now, usually when someone is willing to lay down their life for something, it's for an ideology that they got from someone else, and that ideology could be true or false. The disciples were dying for something that they saw. What could have convinced so many different people that they had all seen a resurrected man? I could explain one witness by saying he's crazy, but all of them? Something was going on here and I had to figure it out, but I couldn't come up with any explanation for why they had that level of confidence other than they actually saw him. The fact that a group of Jesus' disciples 
would know that he did not really rise from the dead, that he didn't ascend into heaven bodily, to go about the Roman world of his day, of that day, and for nearly every single one of those disciples to actually suffer martyrdom for a story that they knew wasn't true, I think is sloppy historiography. Now you might say, well, lots of people have been willing to die for a lie. Yeah, but only if they thought it was the truth. This hypothesis suggests that they knew it was false, they knew it was a lie, and yet they were willing to go to horrible, tortuous deaths for it. And that is just, I think, historically preposterous. From this side, as a historian, I have to give a great deal of credibility to the uh, story as it stands. Third, I started worrying that Jesus might actually be better than me. Now, if you're not a complete moral relativist or maybe one of the new atheists, it's probably obvious to you that Jesus is better than me. But I wasn't the clearest thinker on moral issues back then, so uh, getting my mind around this was very difficult. Here's the problem that emerged. I had two beliefs that just didn't go together. On the one hand, I believe that human beings are lumps of cells, meaningless lumps of cells, and that everything we did was pointless. At the same time, I believe that I was the best, most important person in the entire world. How is it possible to be the best, most important, worthless lump of cells? If there were to be some sort of best person, that would require something like, uh, you know, a standard of good, and that would require something like God, and then someone like Jesus would be better than me. So my beliefs were breaking down at the foundational level. And once the foundations start crumbling, everything starts coming down. I went from believing that I was the best person in the world to thinking that I was the worst person in the world. And in a, in a moment of clarity, it all just hit me, thinking, I'm a guy who once choked my friend until bloody foam came out of his mouth. I hit him with a shovel because he disagreed with me. I don't even remember what it was about. I used to watch my mom's boyfriend beat her and I wouldn't lift a finger to help her. Not because I was scared. I was 200 pounds and I had a gun. I could have stopped it at any time. I just didn't care. And I was proud of the fact that I didn't care. I thought about what I'd done to my family, what I was doing to myself. They brought me food every single day and I was starving to death because I wouldn't eat it. There were other starving people in the world, but at least they could think straight. I sat there thinking about torturing people. My skin was turning yellow. I was scratching myself bloody. What sense did it make to think that I'm the best at anything? When I was thinking about that situation, I just thought, you know, it feels like I've just been stomped relentlessly into the ground. And when I, when I thought that, I started comparing it with a little hospital stay about a year and a half earlier. I got into a fight with seven guys. I'm not saying that to be uh, tough. They won that one. They won that one. Uh, I got one of them. He hit me with a gun and I hit him with, uh, with these guns. And then his six friends got on me and got me on the ground and then uh, took turns soccer kicking me in the head. But I was comparing that to, to the situation I was in. I was thinking, I was okay the next day. I had scratches on my neck. I was dizzy walking around, I had my arm in a sling, but I was okay. Fighting seven guys is a joke compared to what I was going through in that cell. I feel like I've just been stomped into the ground, and when I thought that I felt like I'd been stomped into the ground, I had another flashback. One night I was walking home from a friend's house and a storm hit. There was uh, Rain was so bad I could barely see. Uh, lightning was striking all over the place and I looked up and mockingly said uh, oh is that supposed to scare me if you want me to believe in you better come down here and make me believe I wasn't serious but given my circumstances in the jail I had to start wondering if God had taken it seriously that normally wouldn't have been uh, an option I don't I didn't think like that but since my entire worldview was crumbling I wasn't in a position to dismiss alternatives but there's a problem. 
if there was a God involved in all of this, if right and wrong weren't merely useful fictions, I was in all kinds of trouble, not just for what I had done, but for what I was. How is the worst person in the world going to ever do the right thing? There's no, there's no magic switch that I can flip and, oh, now I care about other people. So how was I going to do anything right? And then it hit me that there are two possibilities. Either I'm violent and selfish and uncaring, and that's just the way things are. Or there's someone who can help people like me. Either I'm all messed up and that's, that I just had to live with that, or there was someone who could deal with this sort of thing. And when you start thinking like that, I'd say you're about two inches away from becoming a Christian. Because when we ask ourselves, who out of anyone ever, who had the ability to take psychologically, spiritually, and morally shattered people and give them new life. We get a list of one. And as he preached, a passerby interrupted him and said, Excuse me, sir. How do you expect an ordinary man like me to figure out the right way? There are thousands of beliefs in the world. Harry Ironside said, Sir, thousands of beliefs? I only know of two. <laughs> said the man, there's Buddhism and Confucianism and Hinduism and Islam and all the isms of Christendom. What do you mean only two beliefs? Ironside said, sir, there are those who believe they can save themselves and those who believe they need a savior. You get a list of one. There's one person on the list. He's the one who said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I didn't know if Jesus was who he claimed to be, but I knew that it was Jesus or nothing. It was Jesus or nothing. If anyone has God's stamp of approval, it's the guy who rose from the dead. History is filled with dead options. Jesus is the last living option. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of the 
deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him for you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! The entire world looked different, like everything was a different color. For the first time in a lot of years, I didn't want to hurt anyone. And I had a strange sense that I had somehow known the truth all along. God created the universe, but we're something special. We're created in God's image. But we reject God, and in rejecting God, we strive to twist and warp His image, which we bear. For years, I was willing to sacrifice everything for a kind of freedom, just a freedom from external control. It's a false freedom, because we just end up using it to degrade and destroy ourselves, tarnishing the image of God so that we won't be reminded of what we are and what responsibilities we share. True freedom is found in not having this inclination and desire to turn against our Creator. That's the true freedom. After I prayed, I felt like I had been fighting. Not figuratively fighting, I mean physically brawling my entire life, and that I finally had a chance to sit down and rest. That rest never went away. As C.S. Lewis put it, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else.
I am here tonight to tell you about a father who loved his son and a son who loved his dad. The way this story is going to unfold for you is a little bit different because I want to bring it to now. You see, a dad would go home and he would go by the school and every now and then he would pick up his son and say, son, why don't you go to work with me? The boy loved that. And when his dad would just come and pick him up, he was the happiest boy ever. He knew that he would get to spend the afternoon with his father at work and, and he would get his coat and, and they would walk and he, he would bring hot chocolate for his son for his really cold and they would, they would go through. But this boy was different. This boy would see things. This boy wasn't normal. And when, he, when they were walking, one afternoon going to where dad worked, this boy would notice things that other people wouldn't notice. He'd see things other people wouldn't see. He sees a man in a bathrobe in the middle of the street who's yelling at a second story window. He sees a woman who's very angry at him and doesn't really want to hear what he says. This boy, as the rest of the world hustles by, he slows down. He sees the hurt and the pain. He sees the anguish and the sorrow. He sees the window close and a desperate man trying to get a what he did doesn't matter. That he hurting is all that matters. And this boy would see these things. His father rushes and gets him by the hand and says, let's go, we'll be late. He would stop and look one more time. Can I stop his pain? Can I stop her hurt? But the boy loved his father. They would go and they would catch the, the trolley. I think that's what you call it here. We call it a tram. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the words. But he would get on there with his dad. And, and the boy would just notice people. He would look. And that day, one particular, he noticed uh, something as he got on the train. He to explain something. As you can hear, there's a train coming. And I got to get through this before the train gets here. He saw a man. He saw a woman. He saw that the man seemed very happy and the woman seemed very sad. And he couldn't understand why they could be together and one be happy and the other be sad. He couldn't understand that. But the little boy knew that there was something wrong. He had this feeling, this instinct that was amazing, how he cared for other people, but he loved none other than his father. He knew his daddy loved him, and as he watched the world and their hurt and their pain, he knew that he would always have a father, but even notice this, I need you to understand as you hear this story and get involved in the life of this man and his son, I need you to notice that there's no mom. As they walked through the woods, the boy would say to his father, Dad, what will I do when I grow up? What will I get to do? Will I get a cool job like yours? How will I work? He says, I don't know, but I want to change the world. I want to do something great. I want to do something wonderful. I want to help people. I want to do something that, that can change the lives of anyone. I just want to be that great. I just want to do something good. And as he walked with his dad, his dad would say, son, you will be great. You will be awesome. You will change the world. Your life is going to be incredible. There was a train coming. There's always a train. The train is called life. We're all on the train of life. Just riding. Whether we realize the truth or not, whether we realize what's happening or not, we're all on that same train tonight. Only God has saw it fit for us to be in the same room, in the same car, for such a time as this. When they get to the edge of the train track, he can see where his father worked. You see the bridge? That's what his dad did. You see, the bridge was very, very important. Boats needed to come to the harbor to get off their goods so they could make money. But trains were coming with people going from one town to the next. Not many cars in Europe, so they couldn't use a lot of that. So many people, not enough roads, so everybody used that train to get from the town to town to get to work and to get home. And one day the train was coming by. What you have to understand is that boy loved going to work with his dad. He would stay right by the river's edge and he would do what he loved to do the most. Let me explain that. He loved to fish. Anybody like to fish here? Oh, all the guys go, uh, uh. The dad looks at his boy and he says, son, now remember the rules. You got to stay right here because I can see you from the window right here. Don't get out of the sight of this window because you got to stay there so I know you're safe. Catch you something good to eat. But as you can hear, the train's coming. The father's job was cool. 
If I wasn't a preacher, I wouldn't mind doing that. Get to work. Get grease on you. Even if you didn't have to, you just squirt it on you like you feel like you did something. That's what I would do. <laughs> there was a boat coming in the harbor. Timing is very essential. I'll go ahead and give you the key. The key is this. There's always a light. Everybody say light. Say it again. One more time. There's a light that the train conductor needs to see. If that light is green, he can go. If it's red, he must stop. You see, God has given us road signs in our life that we must read. Lines that tell us to go and lines that tell us to stop. Whether we read those and believe them or not is up to us. That's why some of you have fallen and you cannot get up. But tonight, that's why I'm here. The boat needed to come through, so he called, and the man said, okay, I got time. It's a long time before the train should come. So he pulls the lever, as you just saw, and the big, big, huge stone steel bridge, the gears started turning. They started cranking the steam. All of a sudden, gears are moving, and that big, huge bridge is just starting to go up. As it rises higher and higher, he has to watch and make sure everything's set, everything's good, everything's fine. As he looks out the window, he can see everything, but the dad, being a good dad, keeps one eye on his work but the other eye on his baby one eye on the world but the other eye on his children you think God doesn't know where you are he keeps one eye on his world and one eye on his child no matter what you've done or where you've been it's one eye on the world but the other eyes on you he's watched you and he's kept you even though your train is coming down the track he understands that and even though sometimes I don't know I want to get ahead of myself see the red light he didn't see it. So many times we don't see the red light. See, to just say, the train was early. The boy can hear and see the steam. And he looks and says, Daddy, the train. Daddy, Daddy, the train's early. Daddy, you got a daddy. Hey, Daddy, 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 the train. Daddy, the train's coming. But the dad was looking at the gears, making sure he had enough oil, making sure there was enough steam to get the bridge back down for the train. And the, the boy knew one thing. Now listen, the boy knew that his dad one time showed him where the trigger was. It was a red lever. If he pulls it, the train bridge would collapse down fast and the train would be able to come across. All the boy knew was there were people on that train. There were people that needed to be saved. There were people that had, some of them just with their friends having a good time. Like everything's fine. They did not know that the bridge was up. They did not know what was coming. They're just living their life like you and me. Just going down the road. Just being our own thing. Doing our own thing. And the dad all of a sudden hears the train coming. He looks and then he says, oh my son. He looks down and his boy's gone. He's like, oh my God, where's my son? Where's my son? He got to figure out. He looks back just in time to see his son trying to save the day. All he had to do was pull that lever. He reaches in to pull it, and the boy pulls too far, and he falls in the hole. Now it's on the father, and God the father. Did you hear me? God the father has to make a choice. It's his now. Do I save my son, or do I save the world? But they don't even know. They don't even know. The greatest decision of his life. He can blame it on them not seeing the red light. He can blame it doesn't matter anymore. Pull the lever, save the world. Leave it up, save your son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whosoever leaves in him the train goes by it's fine everything's cool the bridge is down just like always it's always going to be down are you hearing me tonight he gave his only son for God so loved the world that he gave and you know what's amazing I wonder what God did right when his son died on that cross when he breathed his last breath when he took that breath and he breathed and it was over here's what the 
father would have looked like. They didn't even know, just trying to think of their life, just trying to figure out what they're going to do next. Just thinking about the person they're going to see, the people they're going to hang out with. Just trying to be, just loving, caring. Doesn't matter if you're blind. Doesn't matter if you're putting on a little more makeup, trying to look pretty for somebody, or just wearing another mask. It doesn't matter. God gave his son for you. What will I do when I grow up? Where will I go when I grow up? What will I change? And there was a girl in the bathroom on the train, liquefying her heroin to shoot up one more time. He died for her. He died for her. But in one moment, are you listening? In one moment, as the Bible says, everybody gets a chance. In one moment, to see the look of the Father when He knows what He, when you realize what He did for you, when you realize the sacrifice, when you realize He let His Son die so that you can live, when you realize what He did, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you're at in this life, no matter what you're a part of, you gotta stop. You gotta stop. Even if it's for one second and think, my God, he did it for me. He did it for me. And I pray to God you drop what you're doing. Drop what you're doing. With all the pain and the hurt and the sorrow in the world, he did it for you. That's why you're so quiet. You see, the train's coming. The train's coming. Everybody has things. You have ways of, of I don't want to do that. I don't want to, but why do I keep doing it? Even Paul said, why do I do? My flesh tells me, and I do what I know is wrong, and I don't do what I know is right. you got to understand tonight, the fight is on, and we can win. We become more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. And I'm not preaching just for me. I'm preaching on behalf of you. But what you got to understand is, there had to be a moment in those three days when Jesus died on a Friday and rose again on a Sunday there had to be this moment go ahead look at the screen when it was just God and his baby and his son every sin that's ever been committed in this is rolling through your mind right now I'm here to tell you that as the sun sets in the afternoon, the sun will rise again. And when the sun rises again, you cannot change your past, but you can change your future. You see, it's always a different day. One day someone lives, the next day they die, the next day you wake up and you're still living. You're like, why am I gonna live? Why does this have to be my turn? Why can't I? You can just preach, I can't stop, but I need you to see the whole picture here. You see, because when God the Father gave his only son, when Jesus Christ breathed his last breath and he died, he did it in a way that you can never ever say, you don't know me, you don't understand me, God don't understand my pain, God don't understand my sorrow. You see, that's the very train that was that boy was on. That's the very train that he was on. And as this dad remembers, look real close. You see the pictures of the people? Bam, there they are. But there's somebody added in the picture, isn't it? Bam, there they are. Do you see who's added in it? In every face of every person. Person, Jesus is in their life. Why? Because when you're the greatest sacrifice, you always end up in everyone's life. No matter where they are, who they are, he did it so that you can say he was there all the time. Waiting patiently in line. Jesus Christ was there all the time. And the train keeps going. The train keeps coming train keeps moving people keep living and people keep dying and God the Father just watches it all one eye on the world the other eye on you some of you are starting to figure it out you're like what is he looking for just one girl 
Because see, the whole horrible day, God only had his eyes on one person. And it was just a day on the street corner. When he walked by, he saw a girl with a babe. And she saw him. Do you get it? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. He did it so that we can live. No matter what the sin, no matter what the pain, no matter what the sorrow, the sacrifice was perfect. It was perfect. And it was for you. And God the Father watches it all unfold. And all he can say 